Last time we started talking about uh, pore pressure in the reservoir, and we gave some, some terminology, hydrostatic, lithostatic. What is, a, what is lithostatic approximation for pore pressure? Well, it's, it's when lambda equals to 1, but in words. Yeah, it's when, again, in words, uh, it's when the pore pressure increases uh, at, you know, at the same rate as the vertical stress. And it can never really be achieved, but it, we can use it as approximation. Okay. And of course, hydrostatic would just be the increasing at the, at the rate of a, a column of water, 0.44 psi per foot. So then we talked about overpressure scenarios. So overpressure, you know, by definition, is just anything more than hydrostatic. Okay. So when the pore pressure increases at a rate higher than hydrostatic pressure, and we're going to talk about some mechanisms of overpressure today. And we talked about this a little bit last time, disequilibrium compaction. It's probably the most understood um, this, uh, mechanism. So if you had a reservoir that's, you know, fluid saturated, and you had sedimentation piling up on top of it, well, this fluid is going to try to, or will, diffuse into the sedimentation. But if the sedimentation increases at a rate faster than what the fluid can diffuse, then you can get an overpressure scenario in the, in the original compartmentalized reservoir. And so to sort of get an idea of the characteristic time of, of diffusion, let's think about, you remember when I said when you solve a mechanics problem and you don't know what else to do, what do you start with? Well, force balance, F equals MA. Right? So when you try to solve a problem in petroleum engineering that has to do with fluid flow, what's a good place to start? Darcy's law. So we're going to do that. So I'm going to use uh, so Darcy's law is that the superficial velocity, the velocity is equal to the permeability, k, over the viscosity. And usually we use mu for viscosity, but in Zoback's book, and I want to be consistent uh, with this equation that I'm, we're going to derive, he uses eight of it, right? That, that's just the fluid viscosity uh, times the pressure gradient. And what is velocity in, like, in words? What is, the, what is velocity? Yeah, it's, the, it's the link, yeah. It's, it's a distance divided by a time, right? And so in this case, we're going to be interested in some characteristic distance L over some characteristic time, right? So the, the time, tau, is like the characteristic time that the fluid takes to diffuse over some length L. Okay. So as an aside here, if I have a little block of material, it's sometimes easier to think about it as a solid material, but fluid would work too. Um, in one dimension, so this is a one-dimensional uh, thing, and I apply a stress here, and my little block of solid material 
is going to deform. So my, it's going to deform to a smaller block of material. So the, the deformed length is L. The original length was LO, right? Then you probably remember from solid mechanics that you can, you know, define strain. In this case, the x direction. There's only one direction. Is equal to change of length over length, right? And depending on what sign convention you want to use for what's a positive or negative <coughs> change in length, it would be L minus LO or LO minus L. But if we were to then plot the stress versus strain for an elastic material, we'd get a straight line like that, right? What's the slope of this straight line called? Hmm? Young's modulus. So this is Young's modulus, or the elastic modulus. Right, so we're just going to extend that idea to 3D. So if I have now, instead of just a one-dimensional square, I'm going to have a three-dimensional cube. Three-dimensional cube, that's kind of redundant, isn't it? The cube is three-dimensional by definition. So we have a cube, and I'm going to apply now a stress on each side. And the stress is going to be equivalent on all sides. Okay. And that cube is going to deform into a smaller cube. And since now we're talking about something three-dimensional, we have our tensor, right? So our stress tensor is equal to sigma h, 0, 0, sigma h, 0, 0, sigma h, 0. Because I'm only applying normal stresses, right? I'm not, there's no shear stresses. And then my strain tensor would be like sigma x, x, 0, 0, 0, sigma y, y. 0, 0, 0, sigma 0, 0. <coughs> and so if I wanted to define like an average stress, I could say that that's like one third the, an average hydrostatic stress, right? So the, the, this, this is only hydrostatic. I'm only squeezing normally on all sides. There's no shear stresses, right? So the average hydrostatic stress would be one third times the trace or the sum of the diagonal, right? So in this case, sigma h plus sigma h plus sigma h, and that would be, of course, equal to sigma h. And so if I'm squeezing, if I'm applying a, an equal stress on all sides, are these strains all equal? Sigma xx equal to sigma yy equal to sigma zz? If the material is isotropic, right? if the material is anisotropic, uh, then that may not be the case. So what we'll say is that the total strain then is just, so we're, because they could be different, we're not going to define an average strain. We're just going to talk about the total strain. It's like that. Okay, well, anyway, if I plot this, the average hydrostatic stress over the total strain, I also get a straight line. What's the slope of this line? Well, it has a name. Uh, 
You ever heard of bulk modulus? You ever heard that? Bulk modulus? So we usually use capital K for bulk modulus. This is the bulk modulus. So if I then look at an average strain of 1, and I just assume that whatever corresponding stress that is right here is delta P, then what is delta P over 1 equal to? Well, the slope of this line is the rise over the run, right? So delta P is the rise, del the run is 1. Right? The slope is then K, so it's K. So that's equal to K. Right. So then I'm just going to invert this equation. 1 over delta P is equal to 1 over K. And 1 over K has a different name that you guys probably know in, in petroleum engineering. 1 over the bulk modulus is also the compressibility. compressibility. So we use beta for compressibility. Okay. So let's go back up here and we'll look at this term in our equation. And we're we're going to sort of use a finite difference approximation of it, right? So or a discrete approximation. So we're going to say that the change in pressure over uh, with respect to a change in x, we're going to say that that we're just going to say that that's delta p over l because again l is like our characteristic length. It's, it's what we're interested in, like how the pressure changes over some length. And so then, if we um, we're going to solve this equation for tau. Okay, and I'm going to go to a new screen. So then we have tau is equal to 1 over delta P, eta. K L squared. And 1 over delta P, we just decided it's also <laughs> beta. Right, so then beta, beta over K L squared. And then we can we can also break beta up into, you know, so beta could be the porosity times the compressibility of the fluid plus the compressibility of the rock, or the rock matrix. Okay, so this gives us a characteristic time. Right? These are, I mean, so everything else is reservoir parameters. You can plug in numbers, except for L, right? L is a characteristic length. So if we we're interested in knowing characteristic time for ha for f fluid to fuse over some length. And that's that equation. I, I don't know why my, I have to figure out why my fractions aren't, the lines aren't filling up. So that's that equation we just derived. And then a few common values. So for a low permeability sand that has a permeability of like approximately a millidarcy, then tau is on the order of years for L of a, a 
4.1 kilometers or 100 meters. So for a low permeability sand, fluid can diffuse 100 meters in a few years. But for a low permeability shale, which has, you know, say 10 nano Darcy permeability, then it takes 100,000 years to go that same 100 meters. Well, that's pretty long time, even, even in geologic time. So uh, we can, you know, certainly have sedimentary deposits that can accumulate faster than 100,000 years, such as the fluid can't escape faster than that. So remember, shale is extremely impermeable, right? It takes one natural gas molecule one year to migrate one meter in shale. And so I think we already looked at some data from the Gulf of Mexico, but this is certainly a place where this occurs. So this is a real well. This is data from a real well. Uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, and you know, here's the sort of gamma ray logs and everything. But the the important thing is that to notice is that you know, here's your hydrostatic line, and these are the pore pressures. So the, the pore pressure increases over. So here's the hydrostatic line. This is lithostatic, uh, and so then you have this overpressure region. in the Gulf of Mexico. And why? Why is this so common in the Gulf of Mexico? Because the Mississippi River. The M Mississippi River deposits uh, sedimentation at a rate faster than the characteristic diffusion time. Of the, you know, the, the shales that cement. So that's the most understood, uh, probably, um, overpressure over uh, mechanism. 